Thank you for joining. We are, we're hosting this webinar live from Santa Barbara, California. We've got so many people joining from so many different places. This is really neat to see. We appreciate you know, everyone joining despite the busy rush of end of school year, taking the time out to hear this presentation today. I'm Kristen Morrison and I will be your host today and I want to welcome everyone to our topic, Engaging Today's Families with Five Simple Principles. Brought to you today by ParentSquare. ParentSquare is an, uh, a tool that offers schools and districts a modern two-way communication platform to inform and engage every parent. Again, I'm Kristen Morrison and I'll be your moderator and I'm really excited to be joined today by our featured speaker today, Dr. Steve Constantino. Most of you have probably signed up for this web webinar having heard of Dr. Steve Constantino. And if not, you are in for a real treat. Steve is a nationally recognized speaker, he's an author and an active superintendent. And for the last 20 years, Dr. Constantino has captivated teachers, school leaders, even business people around the country, promoting sound practices of family engagement that really result in increased academic performances. He's currently completing his fourth book, Engaging Today's Families, Five Simple Principles, designed as a, as a field book for educators like yourself, and we're really excited to be getting a sneak peek into, into this book and some of its practices during today's event. So welcome, Steve. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. We also have Lynn Sillers here, co-founder of Parent Square. Lynn has extensive background in driving technology adoption and comes from a family of educators. She is truly passionate about helping schools bring communication into the 21st century with modern technology and best practices. So welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Kristen, and thanks for that introduction. And, and Steve, it's, it's such an honor to have you with us today, and, and I really look forward to this presentation. Great. Thank you. All right. So what are we going to share today? More and more educators uh, and leaders like yourselves recognize the, the powerful rewards of building a parent-engaged community to not only support the success of the overall school, but also student performance. But just as education and learning techniques are evolving to meet today's modern students, we must also evolve into how we partner with today's modern families. So to do this, we believe schools must really identify those new and practical ways to make it easy for parents to, to truly lean in and, and become accountable for, for their child's education. So with that today, Steve will be sharing his five simple yet systematic principles um, that can be used by all schools regardless of, of environment or, uh, or, or any of those challenges that we mentioned to, to truly activate engagement um, with today's families. So with those principles, he'll also be sharing some practical tips for applying these principles into, into an everyday environment. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about um, how to use technology to improve communication to support and activate that parent engagement during a parent square overview that Lynn will be providing later on today. All right, so a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, because we have such a large group, uh, we have everybody placed into listen-only mode, um, but of course we really do encourage an interactive discussion, so please we ask, ask questions, share your comments throughout the, the webinar, and um, even challenge our ideas. We want to hear from you. So. So to do this, you can easily uh, submit your, your questions into the Q&A panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player, and you can do that throughout the event. We'll be taking those questions and fielding them um, over to Steve um, based on uh, where we are in the event. We're also recording this, so you can definitely reference this later on and share this with your colleagues. And one last thing I don't want to forget, um, we are excited to be giving away 100 of Steve's new book, 100 copies away, to our attendees today. So we're going to actually share a link at the end of the event, so please stick around. We're going to share that link out um, and have you fill out a very brief form that gives us your shipping information, and um, 100 of you will qualify to receive that book that will, will be coming out a little bit later on this year. So excited about that. So before we get started, I wanted to just launch a quick poll to get really get a sense of where our audience is around parent engagement. So we're going to launch that right now. 
you're going to see this come up on your screen and you're really what we're trying to understand is what's your main challenge there's there's many challenges of course in in, in uh, engaging the, the parent community but what's your biggest challenge uh, and you know what some of those answers that we have here that we'd like you to select is is it hard to to engage parents um, based on income ethnicity or culture are those some of the barriers that you deal with? Is it just being able to recruit and manage parent participation on a regular basis? Um, are you still trying to figure out how to leverage technology to, to stay in communication and reach parents? Um, and finally, you know, are you, are you, is it more of a cultural issue where you're, it's hard to convince your staff that parent engagement is, is important? So go ahead and um, submit your answers there and we'll, we'll have Steve chime in here in a second and, and we'll review the results. All right. Looks like we've got almost everybody sharing their answer. Let's uh let's wrap it up. I think we've got a good we've got 80 80%. Okay. We'll give it one more two more seconds here. All right, perfect. Let's wrap this up. I'm going to close the poll and we'll share the results. All right. So it does look like it does look like 46% uh, of you did, it's almost a tie, 46% said that engaging parents regardless of income, ethnicity, or culture was the top reason of challenges. And then second to that is being able to recruit and manage parent participation on a regular basis. Steve, what are your thoughts on some of those, those top two answers that we got? They fall in line with the the kinds of comments and answers that I would hear from educators everywhere I have the privilege to travel. So I'm not surprised at all by the outcome of that poll. Okay, good. Yeah, and I think we'll we'll definitely talk a little bit about those two top challenges as we as we move forward and, and make sure we answer some of your questions. So building on that, why don't we just move right into to Steve's presentation and we have one more poll that we'll present a little bit later on but let's let's go into uh, Steve let's let's switch it over to you here and we've got your your great, great slide yeah around ROI thank you great well thank you and thank you to Parent Square and Kristen and, and everyone for hosting me today it's just a, it's a privilege uh, to have the opportunity to talk to so many wonderful people about a topic that is certainly near and dear to my heart uh, it has captured about 20 years of my life I suspect it'll capture the rest of it as well, uh, never going to quite be finished in trying to figure out how to do a better job to engage every family in the academic lives of their children. I thought we'd start today very quickly uh, to just um, talk a little bit about why, why does this matter? Uh, I still have conversations with people who say, you know, family engagement is a great thing, Steve, but geez, you know, we've got, we've got to pass these tests and we've got all these things in school and we don't have time. Uh, you know, I hope we have the time sometime to really delve into this family engagement thing. And those are pretty common conversations I have around the country. I have them in my own school district, quite frankly. Um, so I, I thought I would remind everyone, again, this is the point of this webinar is not to, to delve into research. So here is one slide, and, and this encompasses uh, I don't know how many thousands of research pieces that have, research studies that have gone on, on and on and on for a long, long time and says, you know, if you were to engage uh, in the practice uh, that, that we'll talk about today, and if you, if you made an equal commitment to family engagement as you do to other initiatives in your school, what would your return on investment be? I always like to ask that question. Uh, I'm, I, I like to talk about ROI. If I'm going to do something, if I'm going to give you my time, or if I'm going to pay money, uh, whatever kind of energy or resource I'm going to expend, what can I hope to get in return? And research has been very clear for a long, long time. We have improved attendance. Uh, we have students whose grades improve. Uh, however, those grades are managed in particular schools, and that changes from school to school. Test scores improve, both summative tests, formative tests, tests that students might be given weekly, tests that they have to take at the end of the year. All of those things start to improve. We see um, uh, achievement gap uh, diminish uh, in those areas that we have been struggling with for a long time in education. And I also think that we see uh, a great deal of change in attitude and behaviors of students. And I probably could add one to the slide mm -hmm. that talks about, about 
teacher morale as well, teacher attitude, because when all of these things start getting better, teachers start to notice that and suddenly uh, their job becomes more enjoyable and they become more creative and we start to begin to solve some of the problems uh, that we have had uh, for the last 13 or 14 years with, with some of the rules and regulations that we followed. So this slide was just a, a two-minute version of years of research that sets the stage as to why this matters and uh, what, will, what will happen as a result of engaging families. Here's a, a, a brief list of it. As we go on, um, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you a definition of, of family engagement, the one that we'll, we'll use today. And the reason I do this is because everybody has a slightly different view or perhaps a slightly different opinion of what family engagement is. It can mean uh, joining the PTA and supporting the PTA and their endeavors to support the school, uh, wonderful stuff. It can be volunteering in the school in classrooms or for events or for games or concerts or you know, all of the wonderful things that parents and families do to support the school. That too is a, is a wonderful definition of engagement. Today though, I want to use this definition. The degree to which families are empowered to be involved in the educational lives of their children meaning how do we link family engagement to learning outcomes and what degree do the school a school or a school district support the relationships to sustain that efficacy um, and I interchange the use of the words empowering empowered and efficacy efficacy of course and we'll talk about that in a few minutes the power for someone to help produce an effect or produce an effect so can we leverage the efficacy of parents in shaping their own child's academic future? Absolutely. I like to remind everybody that the first and most influential teacher, uh, teachers of children are their families. Many people have said to me over the years, families are the first and best teachers of their children. Um, they may or may not be. What I do know and what we can, we can pretty much rest, rest in, in research is that families continue, have, continue to have the most influence over their children. So can we leverage that influence? Can we, can we make a difference and, and cultivate that and move forward? And the answer is yes. So for a long time, we've been working in this area of family engagement. And about five years ago or so, we started to look at research and tried to look at research in different areas, not just family engagement, but there's a tremendous amount of research about organizational culture. There's a tremendous amount of research out there about engagement, not family engagement, not student engagement, just the science of engagement and what that means. And of course, there's a, a tremendous amount of research about family engagement. What did it all say and what does it all mean? And so on the the this this picture and I'm going to show you this picture again on the next slide and talk a little bit about it but this picture basically shows you that that there is a relationship between each one of these things and there is a logic to these things so as we move to the next slide first of all consider this a logic model a logic model basically is something uh, very quickly that proves something uh, or or something that shows a relationship, or most importantly, something that shows a process. And you'll see one, two, three, four, five, you'll see that it starts uh, at a specific place, it goes around and, and ends at a specific place, and it really does never end, hence the, the reason for the circle. And one of the key points that I hope that I can leave with you today is to think of family engagement as a process. We often think about it as an event or as a series of events. Uh, we have a math night and we want all of the parents to come to a math night, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful idea. We have a back to school night. Uh, we might have an open house. We might have all these things uh, that parents can come to. And we, we think of their engagement uh, as a series of events. Or we might, we might consider their engagement 
in some other kind of supporting role, whether it be make sure that this uh, signed form gets back to school, make sure that your child does X, Y, Z. What this model says is let's take a step back from that and look at how do we get engaging, how can we get to engaging every family? And the answer is that it really is a process. And it's organic in a sense that it goes around that circle and really never ends. Uh, when you get to number five, you suddenly then can take a new measurement of where you where you are at number one. And so the purpose today is very briefly, I'm going to go through each one of these things, try to give you some tips and examples of what it might look like, uh, and, and try to make some sense for you in a very brief period of time of, of, where, of, of where this all can go. So let's move forward. We have... Uh, Number one, a culture that engages every family. And it's important to remember what is culture. Not talking about culture in terms of ethnicity. We're talking about organizational culture. Um, the beliefs and the values and the assumptions and the attitudes and the actions of people within an organization make up its culture. I, I often give examples in workshops of organizations that have very successful cultures and and therefore whatever their business is or whatever their product is they're very successful um, Disney World is an example of an extremely successful business an extremely successful culture you can, we've studied the culture of Walt Disney World and Disneyland and we understand uh, why they do what they do uh, what their beliefs are and what their values are uh, their assumptions, their attitudes, and the actions that people take in their organization. Uh, it's very important. So we take that information and we attach it to family engagement. And we say the first step of success is, is to make sure that we have a culture that engages every family. One of the things that um, we know to be true, and I talk about in workshops and we talk about in the new book, is that we are really good at engaging the already engaged. We, um, and I've talked to thousands of teachers who have put in, oh my gosh, countless hours of work on doing things only to have a result of perhaps a handful of parents participate, or if they do get a large number of, of parents to participate, it really wasn't the parents that they hoped would participate. Uh, it was the parents of the kids who were, who were doing fairly well in school. We're trying to reach the parents of those children who need extra support, who need that little extra help in school so that they too can be successful. So the first step in a process is to make sure, where are we with the culture? And, and in the new book, it actually helps every organization start to assess what do we believe about family engagement? Does everybody in your school think that engaging families is a good idea? Um, and, and be prepared for answers that are yes, no, I don't know, I don't care. Uh, not everybody sees the value in engaging families. We've had some uh, perhaps negative experiences with families, and maybe that's shaped our attitude. Maybe uh, we think, gosh, if, if that's family engagement, then you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm really interested in <laughs> doing any more with that. And so... The, the point here is that it's, it's important before we s launch into initiatives and strategies and ideas, it's important to understand what the culture believes about something. Because as Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker used to say, he's a, a business guru, um, Peter's passed away now, but uh, his famous saying was, culture eats change for lunch. Uh, how many of us in education have started the school year and we sat in our first opening meetings and we've listened to all of the new things that will happen that school year. And by the end of the school year, most of them are either gone or, or going. And a year or two later, no one even remembers those initiatives because, uh, aha, we have new initiatives. Many of those problems are a result of the culture simply not accepting whatever the new idea was or the culture assuming that everybody thought something was a good idea. And that's why this piece is so important. And I'll probably spend an extra minute or two on this 
because it's the piece that everybody skips. So let's look at this. Uh, this gentleman uh, is named Ron Edmonds. Some of you may remember Mr. Edmonds. He was a Harvard professor, a researcher, uh, and was very intrigued uh, by uh, achievement gaps in the 1970s and early 80s. Uh, wanted to know why achievement gaps existed at that time between Caucasian and African American students. And he said this, we can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children with education. Many educators recognize this quote. It's a famous quote. Lots of people have done this, seen this. And the, and the key phrase is, whether we do this or not must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. Uh, there's really nothing new uh, you know, I, I talk to teachers all the time in workshops. I say, you know, raise your hand if you've been in education for, you know, over 25 years, and they raise their hand, and you know, and, and how many new things have you seen? And they actually start to laugh, uh, and I'll say, how many things have you seen that aren't new but have a new name? Oh, they laugh a little harder. Uh, let's face it, you know, there's been a lot of ideas that have come and gone. They're not bad ideas. They simply never, uh, they never really. Um, got the culture changed, the culture never really accepted. But Dr. Edmonds, he actually said this in a speech, but this part is the part that nobody knows. He went on to say, how many effective schools would you have to see to be persuaded of the educability of all children? If your answer is more than one, then I submit that you have reasons of your own for preferring to believe, there's that word, that basic pupil performance derives from family background instead of school response to family background. So that little highlighted section in green is the, is the culture piece. What do we believe about pupil performance? Do we believe that socioeconomically disadvantaged students cannot learn at the same level? Do we believe that children uh, of, of certain ethnicities or children uh, who have whatever differences, whatever labels or differences you want to give them, can they learn at the same levels? Do they have the capacity? What is it that you believe? And I share this with you as the power of a belief system because there's so much research out there that talks about the ability of socioeconomically disadvantaged students to be very successful. And we've seen evidence of that in schools across the country. Yet as a national system, we still, we still are plagued by those gaps. The very same thought process um, goes into family engagement as well. So there's a little bit there just about why beliefs and values and all that's important. Now, number two, this is the one that really uh, I like to refer to as the lowest hanging fruit and uh, communicating and building relationships. We can't, uh, uh, we can't have relationships uh, and not communicate. We can't not communicate and expect relationships. Uh, all of this is, is tied together. And so there's three important points. Number one, two-way communication. And I think, quite frankly, that's the exciting part about uh, Parent Square. I think Parent Square has uh, taken uh, technology, which is very uh, common to us, and said, look, here's an important component uh, of communication. How do we make sure that schools communicate with families and do we have a mechanism so that families can communicate back to us? Traditionally, we have been more successful at one-way communication. We, we're good at sending stuff home, sending information home. We've not been successful as successful as opening up another avenue back toward us. The second obvious idea is the welcoming environment of the school. Um, I always love to tell the story very quickly of going into a very fancy hotel. I don't get to stay with them very often, but every once in a while, go into a very posh hotel, and uh, I'm welcomed, and the door is opened, and my bags are taken, and everything is taken care of, and I go into my room, and I open the closet door, and there's this beautiful robe there, and, and on the on the uh, hanger, there's a wonderful sign that says, this robe is here for your use while a guest, um, if you'd like to purchase uh, this robe. Uh, they're available to you in the gift shop. And I always ask audiences, what does that sign really mean? And everybody instantly says, it means don't steal the robe. Exactly. But what a classy way uh, to say that, to communicate that to me. Uh, where I've been in other hotels where they put a sign on the wall that said, you know, if anything's missing, we're going to charge your credit card. Same message, uh, but a little bit uh, change in the communication. 
the welcoming environments of schools. And then I talk about schools and, and what even I experienced in, in some schools still today is, you know, you get up to the door and there's a sign that says warning, trespassers, you know, report to the office. Uh, again, so we, we know that the welcoming environment of schools is essential into helping us bridge the gaps with uh, families who don't feel as though that they can engage with us. And then trust. We understand that you cannot have a relationship built on trust, and we cannot legislate trust. Uh, we, you know, we often want to say, you know, trust us. We're the educators. We understand what's best, uh, the best way for your children, and we just can't tell people to trust us. The only way that I know that you can legislate tr uh, to get trust is to earn it. And so, as we go through this and continue with this, we see that um, all of these things connect together. When you uh, see the work that's coming out this fall, for every one of, and, I, and this is one example, and I'm not going to show you this for each of the five because we simply don't have time to today, but this is one example of the kind of work that we've done. For each one of these principles, we've created these, for lack of a better term, standards statements. And I've I got to come up with a better word than standard because I, I think we all start to twitch when we hear that word. But here are the three statements that support this notion of communicating effectively. And then underneath those statements, we have written columns of best practices and rubrics and all kinds of things so that schools could take, you could take, for example, this first statement, create and maintain a welcoming and respectful environment, uh, which is inviting, supportive, encouraging to all families. We've actually given you the descriptors of the best practice. We can also give you tools uh, that will be on our website and in the new book to, to measure where you are uh, and to, to determine a starting point and determine what you want to do so you have something that you can measure. We started here and we went to here. So this slide really is just an example of what you can expect when you start looking behind that model. It's more than, than just a picture. These are some very quick ideas that I wanted to share with you uh, today in terms of just uh, what do we do? Uh, you get one chance to make a first impression. Uh, you know, years ago when I was a, a principal, a long time ago, we had these stickers on the door that said, trespassers will be prosecuted, all visitors must report to the main office. And they were a little white sticker with red letters. And I scraped them off the doors and somebody said to me at that time, no, Steve, you know, you violated board policy. I said, well, you know, then, then this will be my last day. But I, it, the policy said that there had to be a sticker on the door that said something. It didn't say how it needed to be said. So I just changed the sticker to a white sticker with blues letters that said, welcome to our school. We're glad you're here. Please sign in at the main office. Same message, uh, but just delivered a lot more differently, kind of like the, the posh hotel and the robes and, and all those kinds of things. Can you go, can you get to where you need to go? I often tell folks very quickly, stand at the edge of your school property and pretend you've never been there. Can you find where you want to go? Uh, if not, there are some things you can do. And then if you, you successfully complete that, go back to the edge of your property, pretend you've never been there, and you don't speak English or read it. Can you get to where you want to go? Some very, very simple, low-hanging fruit that can start to change uh, the, uh, uh, the environment of your schools. What do I experience when I arrive? Does somebody greet me or do I wait? Uh, we have checklists that we'll be putting on the website for welcoming environments. They'll be in the new book. Uh, quick tips for creating welcoming environments for all kinds of school. And then the use of social media. Uh, I don't have enough time to go into it today, but my gosh, it's changed everything. And so let's use that to our advantage. Uh, let's make sure that Twitter and Facebook and, and uh, uh, Instagram and, and all of these things are working for us uh, and not working against us. So just a couple of ideas uh, for creating the welcoming environment. Before we get to the next uh, the next section, I think we're going to do this question. And Kristen, do you want to talk about this? Sure. I was just going to introduce this this poll, um, really building on that belief system that you were that you were talking about earlier. So you know, if any everyone can answer, what percentage of today's families do each of you believe are actually apathetic? Or, or perhaps don't really care or not interested in um, engaging with their, their child's education. So if you could just look at some of these. We have percentages down. We want to get a, just a, a glimpse of what your thoughts are on, on that, that word apathy. Uh, we've got 1%, 10%, 40%, or none of the above. Just give us that sense. We've got a, 
about half voted here. But we, uh, this is a this is a question that Steve has asked many audiences um, in the past, and it's a very important question um, that we'll talk about the answer in a second. All right. Very interesting results here. Why don't we get? Why don't we close up the results? I think we've got a good good sense. All right, we're going to share those. So it looks like, wow. <laughs> Can you see those results? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the results. That's a very interesting. Um, not on you. Once again, not unusual. Um, it's it's an interesting question, and and I think that I bet you every everyone on the webinar probably used their test taking skills to try to figure out what is the right answer. Uh, research tells us that about one percent of families are truly apathetic toward their child's education. That the root of their disengagement is because they simply don't care, about 1%. Interestingly enough, though, there's always a, of a majority of us in education who feel as though that it's much larger than 1%. And so the, the point that I like to make with this question is that while the percentage of disengaged parents might be 30 or 40 or 50%, and you may be struggling, especially in schools where uh, socioeconomics play against us and perhaps where languages are barriers and those kinds of things. Um, remember the second big point today is that with all of the disengagement that you face and you want to change, the, the root cause of it rarely, if ever, is apathy. There are barriers uh, from for all kinds of barriers. Again, we we could have a whole webinar just to talk about that, about the process of disengagement, how people become disengaged, and how you re-engage them with an organization. You know, and, and maybe someday we'll come back and do that webinar. But but the point of this question is, if nothing else, is to remember that when you're thinking about disengagement, when you're disenchanted because there's something that you really wanted parents to engage with and they simply didn't meet your expectations, please don't jump to the conclusion that it's apathy. It rarely, if, if ever, is. And that kind of leads us to the third piece uh, um, of the five principles, and that's this idea of empowerment. And the question that you asked me at the beginning, or the ideas that you presented in the first poll about how do you, how do you work with families whose economic structures and language structures and all kinds of barriers. And, and the answer starts here. It starts with the question of how do you empower them to have a hand in their own child's learning? It starts with the fact that you must believe that they want to. And, and that's why that culture piece is so important. If you don't believe that these families want to, then the likelihood of, of everyone in the organization, you know, kind of bonding together and making that kind of change, uh, it's a longer road, not impossible, uh, but, a, but a longer road. So three key ideas. One, we're trying to leverage the efficacy of families. Every family has value. Uh, th there's a question that I've often asked teachers, and, and not just teachers, all kinds of educators. Does every family have value? Is there value in working with every family? Um, interesting answers to those questions across the country, and, and, and uh, I, I stand in, I never stand in judgment of someone's answer because it tells me where they're at, and all I want to do is understand what do you believe today, and, and maybe six months from now, uh, would you believe something different if we showed you that there could be a little bit of a different outcome? So leveraging their uh, uh, efficacy. How is their engagement connected to their own students' learning? Here's the third big idea that I'd like to share with you. Families will engage with things that they find meaningful and relevant to them. So when you, for example, want to do a math night, and you, you, and I know teachers work incredibly hard, and they set up all these stations, and they have all these manipulatives, and they make all this stuff that parents can take home with their kids. And math night comes and nobody shows up. Uh, or, you know, you've got 10 or 15 parents of the kids who, you know, are doing okay and they're already engaged and everything is great. How do we get, how do we leverage those families who we really, if we could tap into them, uh, we would, we would uh, uh, 
really start to see change. And that is to, con to, to connect it to them. Tell them specifically why their involvement in this will result in a better outcome for their child. Be very specific about that. Um, I, I knew one school that went and did a, a, a series of family visits to about 50 families and said, um, it was a high school, and said, you know, your child has to, was two questions away from passing this state test. And with your help, we can, we know your child can answer those two questions. Are you willing to help us? Every parent said yes. They said, well, we're having an important meeting on Thursday night, and we're going to give you information. We're going to give you materials. And if you'll just make sure that you, you have them available for your students. And so of the 56 families, 48 of them came. And it was incredible. The school had never seen these people, these, these particular families, attend anything. But they made a point of making it meaningful and relevant to them. So whether the family is socioeconomically disadvantaged, whether the family doesn't speak English as a first language, whatever barrier there is, connecting their engagement to their students' learning suddenly gets their attention and starts to leverage efficacy. The last point of this one is that we tend to consider engagement as things that we see, the things that we do at school, the things that we want parents to come to. When research actually tells us that the most valuable engagement happens probably in places we never see it. It happens in homes and in cars and, and on the weekends and in other places. And so I've coined the phrase invisible engagement, engagement that you may never physically see, but you'll see the results of if we can empower and build the efficacy uh, of families. Let me give you a quick idea of, of what that might look like. And then I, I, don't go to that next slide yet, Chris. I'm going to go one idea, and then I'll show you another idea. But um, I always tell the story, and if you've ever been in one of my workshops, I, I tell the same story all the time about when my son was in elementary school, he brought home a folder every Wednesday. And every Wednesday, the folder had things in it that he had done in school, and there was a message from the teacher. And we were to sign a piece of paper and make sure that that piece of paper in the folder got back to school the next day. We did that for years. And I always ask people, and, 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 and I say, raise your hand if you still do that. And, and even today, most teachers, yep, we still do that. And so I ask this question. How do you engage people in things that have already happened? And this deadly silence falls across the room because at that moment we realize you don't. So instead of having me sign the piece of paper, how about engaging me by saying, not fill the folder with what happened in school, but tell me what's going to happen. And then say, you know, we studied um, uh, icebergs <laughs> in science this week. Ask your child what they learned about icebergs and write down everything they tell you and send that back in. Look at the difference. Now you've, you've got checking for understanding. You've got a, a kind of formative assessment. You've got engaging families. You've promoted their efficacy. And they don't need to know a thing about icebergs. All they need to know is to write down what their kids tell them and send that back. So that's an idea of how we can uh, take the engagement, the family engagement that we have and change it a little bit uh, and to get a better result. So. Let me show you this next chart, which I actually stumbled on on Twitter. Uh, and I, I wrote about this in the new book. And you'll see down in the lower right-hand corner, it says, at Teach Heath. Um, and I, I saw this come across Twitter, and I thought, this was, this was great, because these are the kinds of things we talk about in workshops uh, to give parents better questions. You know, we always do our famous two-question test. What did you do in school today? Everybody shouts out, nothing. Did you have any homework? Everybody shouts out no. And sometimes I say to folks, you know, family engagement is as easy as changing those two questions. And so along comes this teacher who just put this out there on Twitter. Uh, and I tracked this guy down. His name is Jeremy Heath. He's, I, I think he's up in uh, Washington State, an uh, uh, extremely creative teacher. I would, I would encourage you to go look at the stuff that he's doing. It's just wild. But these are wonderful questions. And Jeremy gave us permission to actually put this in the new book. What, what a great way to empower and engage people. And you can translate these if you need to translate them. You can do, you can do uh, they are so much better uh, than what did you do in school today. 
this is one other example very quickly of the kind of empowerment we're talking we're talking about so that efficacy and that empowerment and that whole number three is really where where we start to work with those families who have traditionally been disenfranchised or disengaged from our schools the next piece is the decision making in schools I get emails and questions all the time about um, how do we engage families in, in, in uh, um, decision making should families be engaged in every decision those are all wonderful questions we don't have a lot of time to go into those things today but the key points of, of area four are um, are families truly engaged in the improvement process of our schools do they understand it and, and what is their role in doing so how have we looked at policies procedures and practices and look through the lens of families is there anything that we can do to these things to make them more family friendly is there is there a way that we can look at a procedure that may be in place that might be convenient to us and less convenient to family families but with a little tweaking uh, could be different and then having a kind of a value statement that's you know every family has a voice and if some families choose not to exercise their opinion that's okay but does every family have that vehicle to make their opinion known uh, I've had um, uh, people write to me about um, decisions that have been made about school uniforms and attendance policies and tardy policies and everything just all blows up because people are mad and we end, they end up storming meetings and storming the school board and everything just gets out of hand and a lot of that could have been resolved if we really paid a little bit closer attention to this participation in decision-making piece and so really that's that, that's what I wanted to say um, um, about number four there there's uh, again in a very short period of time today you know we can we can look at ways you can you can get parent engagement make sure that you have parent engagement that is representative of everyone who attends your school uh, and there's ways to go about that and the new book actually spells out an entire step-by-step -step process of how to actually get that done and then the last piece of it is community engagement uh, we I often have people talk with me and say you know Steve we'd love more community engagement and I said yeah I, we would too um, what would you what kind of you know what do you want them to do well we want them to be involved with our schools yeah me, I, me too what do you want them to be involved with and uh, as, as you ask those questions you realize that we need to conceptualize engagement so before we can turn to the community and ask for their help uh, or their support or their engagement we need to have a really good concept of what that looks like especially with businesses and people who are really busy um, they're going to want to know what can we do how's that going to help you and the more you can conceptualize it the better you are asset mapping is a way to look at all of the assets that are not not money uh, in your community uh, community asset mapping is is a is not a new concept as a matter of fact if you google those terms you'll see a number of uh, a number of websites a lot of information come up there's research behind community asset mapping and then what kind of community engagement truly supports learning remember everything we're trying to tie back to the learning lives of kids going all the way back to that definition at the beginning of empowering families uh, in the educational lives of their children so how then would the community be able to support our efforts in engaging families with the ultimate goal of supporting student learning so those five pieces this next slide that you're going to see goes backwards a little bit uh, and it shows you again the circle and the, the reason I put it here again is now that you've heard about the process I wanted to just point out to you very quickly I hope that it makes a little bit more sense that number one is number one for a reason and number two is number two for a reason for example if we have a culture that does not value the engagement of every family you know let's just say that you know we have a percentage of our staff who have had bad experiences with families who have never been uh, open to any kind of family engagement training and so their attitudes about families are you know um, the less I see them that the better my day is if you have that culture then the likelihood of building relationships with all of those families diminishes and if you don't 
if you don't have communication and relationships, how then do you leverage their efficacy and empower them? And then how would you roll that into decision making? So suddenly now you see that there's a reason and a rationale, I hope you do, there's a reason and a rationale for why these things are positioned where they are. And, and the new book that's coming out, the new work that I do in workshops, really helps schools from beginning to end so that you, you have a measurable process so that when you're done, you can say, we started here, we ended here, and here's the result that we got. And most importantly, here are the results um, of what has happened with uh, student learning, uh, student achievement, wh whatever, whatever data that you're using in your school that you're looking to improve, family engagement can be um, overlaid over the top of it. And you can see it will help you and add, add to those results. So that's a very quick, uh, I talked real fast and, and probably over time, but a real quick summary of these five very simple principles, culture, communication, relationships, empowerment, decision making, community, uh, in that order. If you, if you, um, and if you go to the website, uh, you'll see on Dr. Steve Constantino, all of this is laid out on the website. Uh, uh, and um, it's just a, 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 another way, perhaps a new way, to look at family engagement. A little uh, to entice you to come to a website, we're just ready now in the next week or so, hopefully, uh, to put out our first free ebook, uh, Building Successful Relationships with Every Family, 10 Practical Applications for Classroom Teachers. Um, every page of my website has a place for you to sign up. Uh, there is nothing for sale on the website. It's all giveaways, and we send out newsletters and ideas, and, and uh, we're just trying to build a community of ideas from people all over, all over the country. And so, um, our first ebook is almost finished. It's uh, it's it's at the designer now. So I hope in a week or two, uh, anybody who is part of our contact list and automatically will get a copy of that, and that's absolutely free to you. So I appreciate uh, your time, and I appreciate you listening today and, and taking the time at a very busy time of the school year to talk about uh, an, uh, a really important topic to all of us. And what I think is really intriguing is that you now are going to have an opportunity to see in action how technology can help leverage some of what we just talked about. I think Parent Square uh, is, is going to show you and, and to talk with you a little bit about what they do, and, and I, I know, just like I did when I saw it, I know that you'll start to see parallels between good family, good sound family engagement practice and what's happening with uh, engaging parents with Parent Square. So Kristen, with that, I will uh, let you take over. Or Lynn, yeah. maybe. Great. I will, I'll just ha quickly hand it over to Lynn, but again, thank you so much, Steve, for, for those amazing principles and I think this is a perfect segue into Lynn's overview of Parent Square and she'll share more about, about that technology and, and some of the fundamental ingredients for Parent Square with uh, for, for parent engagement with Parent Square. So Lynn I'll hand it over to you. Great and uh, and thank you thank you Kristen and thank you Steve so much for that inspiring presentation and, and for sharing those fundamental principles and that they really start to activate parent engagement and uh, but really what, what Steve when you said to go beyond engaging the already engaged that, that really resonated uh, well with me and um, you know I'd like to, sh to hone in on that importance of clear school to home communication and show you how a tool like Parents Square can help schools and district take the next step to easily reach and, and connect with today's families and, and whether we like it or not technology and social media has become a part of our fabric for how we communicate and stay connected. And with that in mind, the posts that are sent out in Parent Square will be pushed to parents in their preferred methods like email, intelligent texting, we have app notifications, we also provide a unique parent portal for, for every parent. And, and all this to allow schools to be proactive in their communication and create a welcoming environment for the, for the parents. So in, in, in today's brief uh, product overview, I'd like to show you how Parent Score help manage and simplify parent communication to, to allow for that effective uh, two-way communication and, and a satisfying user experience for administrators, teachers, and of course, parents. 
So, so with that, I'd like to welcome you to uh, to Lincoln Elementary. Uh, this is the Parent Square, and and this is our our, our demo school. And for those who are seeing our, our communication platform for the first time, I want to point out uh, the clean and simple interface of, of Parent Square, and and also quickly orient you on the page here. So, so we have five tabs across the top, and as a default, the user will always start on this post tab here. And this is also the tab where messages can be posted at the school grade and classroom level. And real quickly, this uh, message board, as I'm scrolling down right now, is also the view that allows administrators to have access to all school tone communication. And, and I will definitely go into more detail about this here in a little bit. Now, our event tab simply shows an individualized view of a calendar, depending on what class, grade level, and group each parent or staff member is a part of. And, and know that we also allow for easy calendar integration for the school as well as parents. And, and, and with this, schools do tell us that they get a lot more dual parent involvement and, and again, allow them to go beyond engaging the already engaged, uh, as Steve talked about earlier again. And, and this people tab here, simply an online school directory, easy to manage, make quick changes to, and we have even incorporated a, a nice uh, search function here to, to simplify it even further. Now, the last two tabs here on the top, uh, we have the photos, photos and files tab. And photos and files can be attached to any post and then sent out in, in Parent Square. And, and the, photo, the photo here and the, the file tab, they're simply placeholders for pictures and also for files uh, to allow for easy access and keep things organized for both administrators and parents. Now, uh, Steve, Steve talked a lot about the importance of two-way communication, and I'd like to emphasize that ParentSquare is the only platform that allows for the combination of two-way communication, engagement measurements, and automatic language translation. And I'll show you a few examples of what that looks like by sharing actual posts. So I'm going to quickly take you down the message board here again, and I'll stop at this. Um, uh, I really, I really like this post, the Mustang Morning Breakfast post, because it has, it has pictures attached to it that parents can view in a nice slideshow from their phone or iPad or computer. And in addition to that, now you can see that parents are able to appreciate the post, you know, show their appreciation. They have uh, provided some comments and and feedback. And you can, you can really see that this interactive component of parents makes it easier for parents to start getting involved and having a voice and sharing feedback, which then naturally leads to a much deeper and richer engagement over time. And uh, it's, uh, Parent Square is quite contagious, I have to say, uh, having children of my own in, in schools using Parent Square. And it's sort of like a Facebook, but then with the added layers of privacy and security. Um, I'm going to take you down one more post here. I really love this uh, fourth grade map project post. And, uh, and it's really a great example on the invisible engagement that Steve touched on earlier, uh, really showing how ParentScore opens a window into the classroom and beyond logistics, extend that learning uh, to home. And when parents know what's going on in the classroom, they can talk about it with their children and ask questions. Uh, about uh, California, for example. I'm sure many of you have seen similar projects like this. And, and I really like to emphasize, uh, you know, the correlation that parent engagement helped drive student success and, and how it all starts with communication. And one other thing about this post is that this teacher had also included a wish list that is quite extensive. You can see how parents have signed up and same goes for a volunteer list here. So, so now let me, uh, get into action here actually and, and, and show you how to send out one of these posts in Parent Square. Our highest priority is simplicity and ease of use since Parent Square is meant for school-wide adoption and, and everyday usage. So to send out a post, whether you're an administrator or a teacher, it's a, the same process. Um, you go ahead and, and click post and you'll go ahead and choose who you want to send out a message out to. So since I'm logged in here as an administrator, I have access to send out school-wide messages, but if I was logged in a teacher, I would have the ability to send out to my classroom or my, my grade level. And, uh, you know, I would just put in a, uh, a subject line. So let's welcome everyone back here to the next uh, school year. I can't believe that's right around the corner, by the way. 
So, you know, again, you just essentially put in the information you want to have sent out here. You can simply translate in ParentScore, have messages go out in both English and, for example, Spanish, and by clicking this checkbox here. Now, you see there are other things that I can do within a post, and I'm not going to go through all these. I, I showed you a few examples of what the when you have a wish list or you request volunteers earlier, but I'm just going to add this particular event to the calendar, you know, so everyone knows to show up for first day of school on August 20th. And then I can schedule posts to go out on later. I can schedule several posts to go out, or I can just go ahead and click send. And of course, we do have an emergency um, uh, feature as well. Now, uh, this is essentially what, what the post looks like. And again, you know, parents can really um, interact with these messages, you know, add this event to their calendar. And as I scroll down here, you see you have a message in both English and in Spanish. And again, parents, when they receive these messages, they can provide comments, they can ask quick questions, they can appreciate all the wonderful things that, you know, the school is doing for their parents for you know for them and you know for their children and I think um, you know that's that's quite powerful right there and uh, you know besides this communication component uh, parents were also provides uh, other valuable features and functionalities and you know we only have a short amount of time here I know everyone has other uh, things to go attend to so uh, I just want to point out uh, a few uh, things real quick. For example, we schools can easily set up groups and committees in Parent Square. You can make uh, private groups and, and public groups. Uh, we recently introduced the ability for private conversations. So if uh, a teacher or uh, you know needs to have a conversation with one or a few parents or, or anything like that, that's available in Parent Square. Now we also have an archive for you, alumni database, I don't know if you saw earlier, but we have a fundraiser, a cash fundraiser. Uh, but one one really important thing that I do want to point out is how ParentSquare captures statistics uh, very intelligently uh, on parent reach and engagement. And instead of showing you the dashboard here, I'm going to actually real quickly go over to show you one of the dashboards of, of an, an existing school. So here you will see the users and, and the parent reach, and then really take a look at this engagement component and participation, the snapshot that you're given, uh, that parents are being engaged, emails are being read, and you know that uh, parents are appreciating, they're commenting, they're signing up to volunteers, so give schools the insight on you know, how engaged their parents are. And we see schools reach 86% participation and upwards of 90% engagement. So that's uh, really exciting. And I think with that, my time is up. And I want to thank you all for staying on and would, of course, love to speak to each and every one of you on a more individual basis to better understand your school and get to know your needs uh, and see if Parents Square can help with your communication and parent engagement efforts in the 2015-2016 school year. And with that, Kristen, I, I think I'll give it back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was right on time. We're really trying to get everybody out of here at the top of the hour, so we are right there at, at 11 a.m. So with that, um, this concludes the webinar. I want to make sure that, um, as promised, we, we are giving 100 of those books away to attendees today. So we are right now sending out a survey link to all of you, and it's a very quick form that you can um, copy and, and fill out briefly you can you can fill it out later but this will basically contains the shipping information for us to send you that book upon its release later this year so again fill that out and we will will let you know if uh, if you are one of those recipients so with that I hope you enjoyed today's presentation um, again you know I hope you were able to glean some of those insights and new ideas from Steve and um, and of course how to use technology from Lynn all around improving that parent engagement and building community, which is so important. Please look for that follow-up email um, alerting you of the on-demand status of today's event. So again, you can share. Um, if you do want a copy of today's presentation, just send me an email uh, at, and uh, or contact contact Parents Square directly. Um, for more information uh, about Steve's material to get that ebook, 
again, go to drsteveconstantino.com. And if you're interested in learning more about ParentSquare, um, we do provide those, those uh, personalized demos and um, can really talk to you about your communication needs. So please contact us there. Follow us on Twitter. We're very active there. Um, so on behalf of Dr. Steve Constantino and us over at ParentSquare, we just want to thank you again for taking the time out of your busy days um, to review this presentation. My name is Kristen, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day.